I have the uh, privilege uh, today of introducing the honorary chairperson for the National Day of Prayer uh, today. Uh, there have been an honorary chairman one at a time through these uh, many years. I think for the last 18 years you've had a, an honorary uh, chairman. And uh, I surely wouldn't want me to tell you this, but she has asked uh, the, some of the most uh, well-known and busy uh, people to come and serve in that role. Only two of them have turned her down in uh, 18 years, and I'm not going to tell you who those <laughs> were. But uh, anyway, we are especially pleased today uh, to have Pastor Greg Laurie as the honorary chairperson. He is a senior pastor of Harvard, of Harvard. Uh, <laughs> boy, that's a Freudian slim. And, <clears throat> of Harvest Christian Fellowship in Southern California, uh, Riverside, California, actually. And uh, it is a huge church that is then um, telecast in other churches. I mean, the, the number of people that are feeding at his table is just remarkable. More than 4,405 people have attended the Harvest Crusades that take place. Uh, Shirley and I attended one a couple of years ago. I mentioned it last night. They were, it was in the Angels Stadium, and there were 50,000 people there, most of them young, who had come to uh, hear about the word of the Lord. I have great respect for this man. He is committed, absolutely committed to the faith. Uh, two days of this week, our program, Family Talk, aired the story of, uh, of Greg's uh, early childhood. And I think he had five different um, father figures in his life, or six and uh, grew up in a miserable circumstance and got on drugs and his life was just a wreck. And he got, in, got exposed to the Jesus freaks, they called them in those days, in the 60s. And he found the Lord in a marvelous way. And ever since, he has been spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is a great pleasure uh, to have him with us today. He's married to Kathy, been married for 38 years, and they have two sons, one of them in heaven, and Jonathan. I don't see him here, but he's been here this week. And uh, Kathy, I heard that your women's Bible study yesterday was magnificent. So, uh, with that, welcome our keynote speaker, Pastor Greg Laurie. Well, I don't think anybody wants to follow Chaplain Black, I'll tell you that. I felt like I ought to give up preaching after listening to him. But uh, thank you so much to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dobson, Dr. Dobson, Mrs. Dobson, for inviting us to be a part of this great gathering to pray for our country. I'm from Southern California. We have a lot of beaches there. Heard about a lady that was walking down the beach and she saw something sort of embedded in the sand and she reached down to pick it up and rub the sand off and it was a lamp and a genie appeared. This is a true story. <laughs> and the genie appeared and said, um, I'm ready to grant you one wish. She said, one wish would happen to three wishes. He said, times are hard. We've had to cut back. You get one wish. So she thought about it for a moment and pulled out a map of the Middle East, opened it up, said, Jeannie, I want you to look at this map right now. Now, you see, all these nations have been fighting for so long. Here's Israel. Here's these other nations around her. And what I want is peace in the Middle East. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm asking, since I only get one wish, for peace in all of the world. Jeannie looked at her and said, are you crazy? I can't do that. That's impossible. Come up with something else. She said, well, I've never found the right man. 
Um, I'm looking for a man that would be considerate and fun, likes to cook, would get along with my family, a man that likes to do house cleaning, a man who has no interest in sports and will smother me with affection. That's it. I'm looking for the right man. The genie said, get that map out again. You know, sometimes things seem impossible. But the Bible tells us with God, nothing is impossible. He can even turn around the United States of America. There are so many causes for concern, and they've been identified already today. But most recently, these horrific acts of violence in places from Aurora, Colorado to uh, Newtown, Connecticut, now these terrorist acts in Boston, and then we have threats from foreign shores. Uh, North Korea wants to destroy us, as does Iran with their nuclear weapon program. So we look at these enemies on the outside, but there's problems on the inside. Historian Will Duran in his book on Rome's history, Caesar and Christ said, and I quote, a great civilization does not conquer from without until it has first been destroyed from within. The essential cause of Rome's decline lay in her people and her morals, end quote. And it's been cited multiple times that what's different between Rome and America is we were founded on Judeo-Christian values, despite what revisionists may want to tell us. But we have so many problems in our country today. It has become as... Uh, Reverend Pat was saying, uh, uh, a freedom from religion, then a freedom of religion. And then there's the breakdown of the family. And I can speak to this with some authority. I came, as Dr. Dobson said, from a broken home. My mom was married and divorced seven times. And she was an alcoholic. And I lived all around the country. And I had to fend for myself. And, and I was a candidate myself for becoming an alcoholic and becoming someone who would get a divorce. But by God's grace, we've been married. I have to update my bio. We've been married 39 years. That's what Jesus Christ can do in one life. And he can do it for a country as well. But so many of the social ills can be traced down specifically to the breakdown of the family. And as Dr. Dobson has often pointed out, fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children. Again, fatherless homes. 85% of youths sitting in prisons today grew up in a fatherless home. It's been said, a family can survive without a nation, but a nation cannot survive without the family. So we see these things under attack. But here's the question. Can we turn the clock back? Well, I, I believe we could have a spiritual awakening. Now, we've had a number in American history, and I pray we have another. It was mentioned I came to faith during the Jesus movement. Uh, that was a revival, and I pray we have another Jesus movement. What is a revival? It's to restore something. Have you ever seen a perfectly restored classic car cruising down the road, like a 1957 Chevy Bel Air? Hey, it's a thing of art, man, come on. I guess I like to say, that's art on wheels. It looks like it drove off the showroom floor. That's a perfectly restored vehicle. To be revived is to be restored. It's to get back to original condition. The prophet Habakkuk understood this when he prayed this prayer, Habakkuk 3.2. I've heard all about you, Lord. I'm filled with awe by the amazing things you've done in this time of great need. Revive your work as you did in days gone by. Show us your power to save us. And that's what we need to pray, Lord. Do it again. Send another awakening. Send another revival. You know, it seems whenever a crisis hits, Americans do understand we need to turn to God. Even on the news broadcast, you'll hear them say, well, we send our thoughts and our prayers, right? And because deep down inside, I think most Americans believe there is a God. Uh, they believe that prayer can work. I mean, remember Congress spontaneously breaking into God Bless America on the Capitol steps in the aftermath of 9-11. And you know, you stop and think about that song written by Irving Berlin in 1938. It's actually a prayer. And before the familiar refrain begins, it says, when the storms, 
When the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let's be grateful to a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. And then it says, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. It's a prayer. God bless America because we're in that night and we need that light from above. One verse that's been cited today is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Contextually, it was given to the nation Israel, but principally it applies to any nation at any time when God says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. That's interesting. It's, it's directed to God's people. So often we're quick to point a finger at Hollywood or at Washington. But God says the problem is not so much the White House as it is my house. My people need to turn from their wicked ways. You know, there are not only sins of commission, that's doing what is wrong. There are sins of omission, that's not doing what's right. And the Bible says, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, it's sin. And to not pray for our country right now, folks, I believe is a sin. We have to pray for America because there's no other hope. I like what Pat said last night. He was talking about the part where God talks about seeking his face. And he illustrated it with the story of one of his little grandchildren. Do they call you Daddy Pat? Pat, yeah, right. That's his, his, I'm called Papa by my five grandchildren. Uh, well, four. One's just a baby. He hasn't called me anything yet. But um, so Daddy Pat, one of the little girls, his little granddaughters was with him and he was talking with someone else and she wanted his attention, was pulling on his sleeve and he wasn't giving her his attention. So she grabbed his face and turned it toward her. And I want to talk to you. So we're seeking his face. We're saying, Lord, we're serious about this. This is not a casual flip in prayer. This is desperate because times are desperate. Let me tell you a story now that most of you probably know from Acts chapter 12. It's a story of when the church was being persecuted. It's a time when things were looking very bleak, but it is also a time where things changed dramatically as a result of prayer, and I might add they changed quickly. Well, of course, it's Acts 12, and here's what we read. At that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand, to harass some from the church. He killed James, the brother of John with the sword. And when he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison. But I love this verse. Listen, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Things were looking bleak. James, the brother of John, one of the apostles, had been put to death. I wonder how hard the church prayed when James was arrested. They might have thought, oh, he'll be all right. He'll get out of there. And then when they got the news, James was dead. And now Peter was arrested. They realized, this is serious. We've really got to pray. And we're in a similar situation in our country right now. Peter was behind two gates, chained to two guards, and guarded by 14 more. So what did the church do? Well, we read that the church organized a protest and stormed Herod's palace. No, actually, that's not there. No, we do read, though, the church organized a boycott of all products made in Rome. No, we don't read that either. No, instead, the church used their secret weapon. And what is the secret weapon of the church? It's prayer. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Though all other doors were closed, one remained open, the door of prayer, the door into God's presence. The way through to Peter was the one through God. It's been said Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Oh, he doesn't want us to pray because he knows there's power in prayer. So here's some principles that we can apply in this great prayer meeting. And by the way, I... I was told that this is the largest gathering of believers to pray for our country in our nation's history right now. So that's fantastic. That's fantastic. (laughs) 
And that's due in large part, obviously, original vision and persistence of Vonette Bright and, and uh, getting President Reagan to sign this great bill, making this an, an annual event. And then, of course, uh, Mrs. Dobson and Dr. Dobson as well, and so many others that are a part of it. But what do we learn from this? Number one, the prayer that changes things is the one that is offered to God. You say, well, Greg, isn't all prayer offered to God? Not necessarily. Sometimes for some, prayer can be a performance. They'll say their prayers, but they never pray. You know, we'll teach our children prayers. Maybe we'll say to them as they're getting ready to go to bed, now pray this after, you know, mommy or daddy, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Is this a good prayer to teach a child? <laughs> now, honey, if you should die in your sleep, pray God takes your soul. Now, good night, sleep tight, and don't let the bed bugs bite, right? Now. Okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a little prayer, maybe not a good one. I'd rather teach a child how to pray. And a lot of times we can talk about prayer, but we never pray at all. I think the key in prayer is aligning our will with God's will. Prayer is not getting God to do what I want him to do. If I'm in a boat and I throw my little rope to the dock and I pull myself closer, am I pulling the dock to the boat or am I pulling the boat to the dock? Prayer is when I'm pulling myself toward God and aligning my will with his will. Never be afraid to pray. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now here's the question. Does God want to send a spiritual awakening to this country? I believe he does. So I think we can pray authoritatively and confidently and constantly. And that brings us to another principle. They prayed with passion and persistence. It says constant prayer was offered to him. Constant, not just a one-time prayer. People give up too easily. Oh, I prayed once. I guess God doesn't want to do it. Jesus said, Ask and it shall be given. Seeking you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. In the original language, it could be translated, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, pray with persistence. Are you praying with persistence? Are you storming the gates of heaven for your praying like that for your family? Praying like that for your church? Praying like that for your state? Praying like that for your country? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. If we put so little heart in our prayers, we shouldn't expect God to put much heart in answering them. So pray. And by the way, they prayed to the night. They prayed and prayed and prayed. And number three, they prayed together. That's what I love about this meeting. We're praying together in this room. And believers are praying together around the United States and even abroad right now. And there is power in united prayer. Jesus said, if two of you will agree on earth, touching anything, they shall ask it shall be done of them on my Father who is in heaven. Now that doesn't mean we can just dream up whatever we want to pray for, and if we can get two fools to agree on it, we'll get it. Because sometimes God will overrule silly prayers. But when we are praying according to the will of God, as I believe we are when we ask for God to send an awakening to America, I believe there's a lot of power in united prayer. Now the fourth and last principle about the prayer of this early church is not commendable like the first three. Remember they prayed to God, they prayed persistently, they prayed together, but the fourth principle is undeniable, they prayed doubtingly. <laughs> you see it in the story. I hope this, uh, if you don't know the story, this is a spoiler alert. Peter gets sprung from the prison. So here are the believers praying, and God answers their prayer. I had the privilege to be in the Pentagon earlier today and give a message similar to this. And um, uh, <laughs> but I've never been through so many doors and hallways in my life. I mean, I, I would have been lost if someone wasn't guiding me and up these stairs and down those stairs and through this door and through all these other things. And it's sort of like what was happening with Peter. He's laying in prison, he's in deep sleep. Interesting, he was probably the only person getting a good night's sleep in town that night because he was confident in the will of God. So an angel appears and wakes him up. It's kind of funny almost. It sounds like the angel had to like kind of whack him a little bit. Uh, 
And Peter wakes up and the chains fall off and the guards are asleep and the doors open up automatically and Peter thinks he's in a dream and he finally is out on the street and realizes God has delivered him. So where does he go? He goes over to a house where they're having a prayer meeting, probably for him. He knocks at the front door. Someone comes to answer it named Rhoda. She looks and there's Simon Peter standing before her and she goes back and tells those great men of God who are praying who's at the door. So imagine that for a moment. Oh, Lord, they're praying. Deliver our brother Peter. Lord, do a miracle. Lord, send an inch. Excuse me, guys. Lord, shh, don't, and, and we're praying. Lord, do a miracle. We're trusting you. Excuse me, guys, uh, uh, don't bother us. Uh, guys, what? Peter is standing at the front door. And these great men of faith said, and this is directly from Scripture, you're crazy. <laughs> they prayed with doubt. Here's my point. Sometimes we're shocked when God answers our prayers. And we shouldn't be. And you know, we need to keep praying. And we need to come with as much faith as we have. I like the story of that one guy who had a demon-possessed son and said, Lord, deliver my boy. And the Lord said, well, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes, it'll happen. The guy, I love his prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. What did Jesus do? He healed his boy. That was good enough. So we come with as much faith as we have. Maybe there's some doubt, a sense of, oh, this isn't going to work. Let you just pray. Just pray and let's call on the Lord and see what God will do. Well, you know, as that chapter comes to an end, uh, history and scripture come together and tell the same story as they always do. Uh, the more archaeological discoveries that are made just confirms the authority of scripture. The Bible is among other things, a very accurate historical book. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus tells us Herod got up to give a speech and he was dressed head to toe in silver and the sun was reflecting off of it. And then the scripture tells us Herod gave that speech and when he was done, the people began to say, it's the voice of a God and not of a man. And Herod was absorbing all that praise and the Bible says, and the Lord smote him. <laughs> He went down, and both Josephus and the scriptural account agree on that. And so look how the chapter begins. It opens with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. It closes with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. It ain't over till it's over, and it's not over. So our theme scripture for this year's National Day of Prayer is Matthew 12, 21. In his name the nations put their hope. And so we come with hope. And what is hope? There's a good acronym for it, H-O-P-E. Aren't you impressed I can spell hope? Uh, H for holding, O for on, P for patient, E for expectation. Hope, holding on with patient expectation. Hold on and keep praying and expect God to work. The Lord is calling out to us and we need to take his call. I don't know, you probably all have a smartphone. I have one right here. I won't say what brand. This is not a product endorsement. It's an iPhone. Um, <laughs> I think Androids are out selling them now, but when someone calls me on this phone, their name appears on the screen. Does your phone do that? So when I, I get a call and Kathy Laurie, my wife, her name appears. I always answer it. Now when I call her, she doesn't always answer. And I'll talk to her later in the day. Why didn't you take my call? She said, I, don't, I didn't hear your call. Her phone's always on mute. But then there are people that call and the moment their name appears on the screen, you say, I don't have an hour right now. Do you know one hour people? You know what I'm saying? You like them, but you don't have an hour. One hour, can't do it. So what do you do? You let them go to voicemail, right? Then you call them back at your convenience. What if your phone rang and you picked it up and you read, Jesus Christ? Wow. Now you have a choice, accept or decline. Answer the call or send them to voicemail. I believe Jesus is calling us as individuals to believe in him and be forgiven of our sin because he died on the cross for us 2,000 years ago and rose again from the dead. 
And he says he stands at the door and knocks. And if we'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in. And I believe he's calling to our country right now. And he's saying, call to me and I will do marvelous things. We need to call to the Lord right now. So I would like to close with prayer. That's why we're here. And this is a prayer for our country. And uh, let's all pray together, if you would, please. Just bow our heads. And Father, we come to you to pray for our nation, the United States of America. Lord, you've blessed us through the years. We rightly sing, America, America. God shed his grace on thee. But yet, Lord, we do see trouble in our culture today. We see the breakdown of the family, crippling addictions, random acts of horrific violence. Lord, we need your help in America. In recent days, it seems like we've done our best to remove your word and your counsel from our courtrooms and our classrooms and our culture. It seems as President Lincoln once said that we have forgotten God, but Lord, you've not forgotten us. You can bless and help and revive our country again because scripture tells us righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you would exalt our country again. We have had many awakenings in America. We have experienced times of refreshing and revivals that not only changed us spiritually, but it changed the moral landscape. As the psalmist said, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? That's our prayer for America today. Send a spiritual awakening that will turn the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, back to you. You've told us if we'll humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, you'll forgive our sins and heal our land. So Lord, forgive us and heal this troubled land that we love so much. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and thank you.